All right, good morning, everybody. We're um, obviously celebrating this weekend, especially if you're new to Prescott Valley. If you've been in town at all, you see, uh, you'll notice that Prescott Valley is a very patriotic town. You probably noticed the American flags all over the place. Um, I know we've got some at our park right by our house. They've got a huge display. They've got them all along the freeway and interstate and stuff like that. Um, and of course, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And I was explaining to my daughter, she was asking about the flags and explaining what the, the day is all about, you know, where you're remembering. It's a memorial for the soldiers that have died in battle um, in various wars to, to supposedly help, um, you know, protect our freedoms and fight for this country. And that's the, the, the purpose of Memorial Day. I'm not going to bash Memorial Day. I don't have a problem with it. Um, but what I, and actually it's kind of interesting because the sermon I had prepared for this morning, I didn't even have Memorial Day in my brain. It wasn't even, I wasn't even consciously thinking about it, but it actually fits right in with what I'm going to be preaching about. That's why I'm even bringing it up now. Because um, this morning, the title of my sermon this morning is, Are You a Soldier? Now, this Memorial Day, most people are thinking and remembering of the, the physical battles, the physical fights that have happened in this world. But we as Christians, and one of the things that I think that I'd like to remember, and keep your finger here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, flip forward a few pages just to Hebrews chapter 11, is I like to remember and memorialize the great Christian soldiers that have fought that have stood up for the truth, that have preached the gospel in, in, in hard times and when they've had a lot of afflictions and persecutions and tribulations. Because the Bible, well, we're going to see this in a little bit, the Bible is calling us to be soldiers. And that's one aspect of the Christian life. And in Hebrews 11, I think we get a, a great memorial. At the end, you know, Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. And at the end of the chapter, it just goes down this list. You know, the whole chapter talks about, brings up Moses and Abraham and, and great men of the Bible and the things that they did through their faith in the Lord. And at the end, it just kind of does a real quick rundown here. Look at verse number 32. The Bible says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, we read down that list. It's talking about many godly people throughout history that have, that have faced all these types of fights and trials and persecutions. And this is why it's important to get this message this morning about being a good soldier because there is nothing that exempts us from going through the same things that these people went through. And we need to be ready. And if you're going to be able to stand through and stand strong and stand firm on God's word and not back down and not compromise, you're going to need to be ready as a soldier for Jesus Christ. We need to be strengthened. And actually, not only are we not exempt from it, it's my personal belief that we probably, many of us at least, will end up going through the great tribulation. I think we're close enough in our time to the return of Jesus Christ, that this will become a reality. Now, I can't say I know that for a fact because no man knows the day or the hour, but when you see the way things are going, you see the signs of the times, you can see that the, the, you know, the, the wars and rumors of wars are, are starting. I believe we're getting into that time frame. And we need, it, whether it happens or not, we need to be ready for it because we don't know. And we need to make sure we're prepared and ready. Just a couple of references. Flip back, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, where we started. 
There are a few references to just being soldiers, and the Apostle Paul referred to a few people as being fellow soldiers. In Philippians 2.25, the Bible says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he had ministered to my wants. And in Philemon, verse number two, the Bible says, And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, into the church in thy house. He's referencing people as being, hey, they're my fellow soldier. Now, obviously, our war, our battle, is not, he's not talking about taking up arms. The Apostle Paul was not, you know, getting his swords and going out and, and physically going into a battle or confrontation with people. That's not what he was about. He was an evangelist. He went out and preached the gospel, right? But he considered himself and others that were working with him and that were laboring and doing this great work for the Lord as soldiers. They were fellow soldiers with him. And this is one aspect of our Christianity that we need to understand and we need to be prepared for. Now, as a Christian, there's many hats that we need to wear. There's many things that we need to be, you know, mindsets that we have to have. But the one, and, and I'm actually going to preach next week on the appropriate time and when you kind of put on the hat of being a soldier versus when you put on the hat of, of being any other role that we need to fill as a, as a godly Christian, as someone um, who's, who's doing the work for the Lord. So, um, but this week, I'm just going to focus on this one aspect of being a soldier. So look down there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 3. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a, a soldier. So how are we going to be a good, he's telling them, look, you, want, you need to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So how are we going to be a good soldier? Well, in this context, the specific attributes are mentioned in order to be a good soldier. As a, a, a soldier, you, we need to be ready to fight. Right? I mean, that's what soldier, what is a soldier for? They're there to battle. They're there to war. They're there to be in a fight. So you need to be ready for that. And the first thing he mentions here in verse number three is endure hardness. Endure hardness. So we need to be able to be strong in order to endure the hardness that's going to come our way. You need to have it settled in your mind that one, afflictions will come. As I already read in Hebrews chapter 11, those are serious afflictions too. This isn't just like minor afflictions. Now, if you're going to be a good soldier, we need to be prepared for the worst. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that get offended very early on and very easily. The, I'll tell you what, if you, when you get saved and you start reading your Bible and you start talking about the things of God, I mean, it's one thing to be saved and no one even knows about it. If you're saved and nobody knows about it at all, you're probably not going to face persecution. You're probably not going to face affliction. But if you actually do anything with your salvation, if you actually start reading your Bible, talking about it, going to church, you know, living the way that Christ actually wants you to live, then you can expect persecution. And usually the persecution starts among family and friends. That's where you're going to start to see, at least these days with what we're dealing with, that's the first place you're going to start to see is people either mocking you, coworkers, you know, people making fun of you, because of the changes you're making, ridiculing you for not doing certain things anymore. Oh, why aren't you going to go out to the bar with us? Or, you know, as you're trying to clean up your life and live a godly, separated, peculiar life under the Lord, people will recognize that, they'll see that, and you'll start to receive some of the afflictions. But if you can't even endure those afflictions, how are you ever going to endure the afflictions that we read in Hebrews 11? I mean, people being sawn asunder, right. people being you know, arrested and killed and martyred. And, you know, I mean, that's serious persecution. That is serious. I mean, that's, that's the real deal. Right. We need to prepare ourselves for the worst so that way these other afflictions, I mean, they really should just seem like nothing. When you're ready for the worst, the minor afflictions aren't going to be nearly as bad as they may seem to be right now. And the only reason they seem real bad is just because you're not ready for it. You need to be ready. You need to prepare to be a good soldier. We need to have it settled in our mind that afflictions are going to come. I'm just going to, you could turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, just one chapter over, verse number 12. The Bible says, Yea, and all. 
Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That word will means it's your desire, it's your will. So if you want to, if you're trying to, if you will live godly, you're trying to live the right way, godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. You can just mark that down. As true as the Bible is, if you know as true as your salvation is, as true as you believe that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ, you shall suffer persecution if it's your desire and you, you know, to live a godly life, to live the way that the Bible says. That's why I said, if you, don't, if you decide not to live a godly life, if you decide to be a bad child of God and just don't want to do anything, if you want to be him that worketh not, but believeth, you may not have any affliction. But if you want to live godly and do what God has, if you actually appreciate the gift that God's given you and you want to show your appreciation by listening to him and doing what he's telling you to do, guess what? Be ready for, for persecution. Be ready for tribulations. Be ready for affliction. Uh, you don't have to turn it, but in Mark 4, we're going to be going, actually, we're going to be going back to that in a little bit. We've got the parable of the sower. Mark 4, 16 says, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So these are people who get saved because they heard the word of God and they receive it. They believe the word. They believe it was spoken. They receive Christ as their Savior. They, they receive it with gladness. They're happy about it. Praise God. Verse 17, and have no root in themselves. They're not strong. They're not ready to endure anything because the root grows down and gives you strength to stand up to the winds or anything else that's going to come your way, right? As a plant, a plant gets rooted down. And if you have no root in yourself after you get saved, you get blown over. And it says, and so endure, but for a time, Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. And this is where we don't want to be. You don't want to just be immediately offended. Some, any, the smallest of afflictions or persecutions come up and you're just out of church. I can't deal with this, you know, and, and forget, a, forget it all. And just giving up, throwing your hands up in the air. You've got no root in yourself. If you're going to last at all in the Christian life, if you're going to endure, you need to get rooted down. You need to understand, you know, get in the Bible, know what you believe, and be firm about it, and be ready, and just know. There's, there's so much value to just knowing, just having the knowledge, hard times are going to come. I can expect this. When you have no clue that something's going to happen, it can, it can, it can knock you off your feet. But when you know in advance, hey, this is going to happen. You know, you get, if you get into a, a boxing match, right? You get, you get ready, you get geared up, you prepare for it. You know that there's going to be a guy on the other side of you trying to hit you. Right? You'll be prepared for it. At least you'll have the best shot possible of, of winning that battle and, you know, and being ready for that fight. But if you're just walking down the street and someone just, boom, just out of nowhere, you don't even see him coming. You're going to be way more injured. You're going to be, you know, you have much serious consequences. It's going to knock you out. Knowing what's going to happen in events. But if you knew that same example of someone just, just blindsiding you, if you had any knowledge at all, if you saw someone, if someone told you, hey, there's a guy right around that corner that's looking to knock someone out, it's a lot less likely to happen. You're a lot more likely to, to, to be strong, to stand up, to be aware, and to not, and to not allow that to, to knock you out. Just having that knowledge. We need to have the knowledge today of, of the, the attacks and the persecutions and the hardships and the trials that are going to come our way if you're going to live godly. So you can just be ready for it. And just say, when it comes, you can say, wow, this isn't a surprise. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily make it better. You're still, you're still going through whatever the persecution is. But at least you could say, hey, I knew this was coming. So I've done my best to prepare myself to get through this time. And I know that everything will come to pass. We know that God is not going to allow us to be tempted above that we are able to, to endure or to bear. That whatever it is that we go through, there's always going to be a way out. There's always going to be um, you know, something to where God is going to uh, get us through that time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but in, in verse number 2, the Bible reads, And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you, Concerning your faith, 
he's sending t Timothy to, to comfort the Thessalonians concerning their faith. Why? That no man should be moved by these afflictions. The afflictions that Paul was receiving, the afflictions that they are going to be receiving, any afflictions that they see happening to people living a godly life. He doesn't want them to be moved. So he's saying, hey, I'm going to send you Timothy so he could strengthen you, he could help you, so that you could endure these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed there unto you. So you already know that this is what we're going to go through. So I'm going to send Timothy to strengthen you, to get you ready, to get you battle ready, so that you don't just fall away and quit the faith and quit living a godly life because you don't like the afflictions. He said, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know, we already told you about this. And I'm telling you this morning that if you're going to live a godly life, you will endure persecutions and tribulations. It's going to happen. So be ready for it. Be ready for it. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. So that's the heart, one of the hardnesses we have to endure. But in order to be ready, there's another hardness you have to endure. In order to strengthen you for the, the outside hardness that comes your way, the persecutions and tribulations, you need to be ready to endure hardness within the church. You know, that, that's a different hardness. It's a hard preaching. Hardness from God's word. The hardness where you say, wow, that stings. Oh man, that's bite. Oh, that's talking about me. I need to do something different. I need to change. That's what hard preaching is all about, is bringing up the sins and bringing up and preaching the truth from the Word of God to show you, hey, you're not perfect. You need to get this right in your God, so you get it right in your heart and in your life so you can be right with God. Soldiers go through a boot camp, and the, point, the purpose of the boot camp is to give them, in a short period of time, intense training and to prepare them and to put them through right, some of the worst things that they could think of to put them through so that way when they come through, they're a lot stronger, they're a lot better, they're able to, they're well more equipped to handle what comes their way. That's the purpose of their boot camp. Their training doesn't end, but that boot camp is intense and it really tries their limits. Well, when you come to church and you're hearing the hard preaching, this is your spiritual boot camp. We're going to be giving you some hard preaching. We're going to be testing you and trying you and, and hopefully strengthening you so that by the time you get through all this, yeah, you might come to church and be like, oh man, you know, you might feel kind of down. You might be, you might get, uh, leave thinking that you're, um, you know, with some godly sorrow. Godly sorrow over, oh, I can't believe I've been doing this and, you know, I didn't realize how bad this was, but man, this is a bad sin. I need to fix this. But hopefully you have godly sorrow that works repentance so you could, you could change. You could get right and then you get that much stronger. You could get through that and you are so much stronger at the end. You need to be able to, if you're going to be a good soldier of Christ, you need to endure the hard preaching and not get offended. In John chapter 6, we see examples of people who did get offended. John chapter 6 is where he talks about, you know, I'm the bread of life. And he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Or a lot of people didn't understand that. And they're just like, whoa, okay, this is crazy talk. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. They didn't actually say that. But <laughs> that, was the, that was the type of attitude that they had. Verse number 60 is where we're going to start reading in John chapter 6, verse number 60. Many therefore of his disciples. So this is Jesus' disciples. Now, it's not just a believer, a disciple, someone who's actually following Jesus Christ. They're actually going with him and, and, and hearing his teaching and learning from him. Not just someone like maybe potentially the woman at the well who got saved, right, but didn't actually continue to follow Jesus. A lot of people can get saved. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, but you don't actually continue to follow. These are his disciples. Many, of his, many therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Oh, this is hard. This is hard preaching. Well, are you going to be able to endure it or not? Because if you're going to be a good soldier, you need to be able to endure the hardness. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Oh, are you offended by my preaching? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? 
It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Jesus is trying to strengthen them. He's, he's teaching them. Yeah, it may have been a hard message. A hard, you know, how, how, what are you talking about? I can't understand this. A hard saying. But he even clarifies. He understands. I'm murmuring about this. Are you offended by this? Are you offended by what I'm saying? Are you, you, you can't understand this, so you're just going to be offended at it and say, oh, I, I don't know if I could agree with what he's saying now. Yeah, they, they were liking all the nice things he was saying, but when he said something a little bit hard, that the Pharisees couldn't handle. Now all of a sudden it's, well, I don't know about this stuff. Right. This is going a little bit too deep for me. It's going a little bit too far for me. Yeah, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I don't want to go that far. I, I mean, you're kind of extreme here. I'm not going to take things that far. And they're not willing to do it. They get offended. They're not able to endure the hardness. And what happens? They quit. What do you think those disciples end up doing with their life? Who knows? We don't, we don't even know who they were. It's just many of his disciples. They left. Now, thankfully, the 12 didn't leave. They knew better. They're like, where are we going to go? You're the Messiah. I mean, you're the Christ. Like, what, who else are we going to go to? Of course, we're going to stick by you. And did, did his disciples understand everything? No. Many times they didn't understand. It's obvious. And Jesus is continually trying to explain things to them, but... They continued to follow him because they knew that he was the way, the truth, and the life. In the book of Proverbs, you don't have to turn it. Turn if you would to uh, turn if you to Hebrews chapter five. Church is our spiritual boot camp. You need to be ready to hear the hard preaching. Don't be like these disciples of Jesus that just left him. Just turn back from following him. Well, this is too much. You need to be strengthened in yourself and you need to be willing to hear rebukes and correction because that is probably the number one reason why people get out of church. At least out of a good church. Because they, they, they're fine for a while and then it's usually just one thing one sermon, something they just don't like, they just don't want to hear. Oh, I can't believe this. I'm out of here. Yep. And just like these people, I mean, with Jesus, there was probably many things that they were, they were right on board with with Jesus. He says one thing that they don't like. Oh, I'm out of here. I, I can't do this. You get away from following Jesus, you get out of church, it's going to be a long backslide for you. You need to learn how to deal with the one thing or two things or whatever it is that comes up that, that you feel like you're offended by and get past it. Amen. And have the right heart when you come into your boot camp to be ready to receive and to be ready to be trained and to be ready to be taught from God, not just from some man, but from God's word. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. In Proverbs 9, 8, the Bible says, reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. If you're wise and you hear a rebuke, you hear that you're doing something wrong, you see it from the Bible, you should love that person, not, oh, I'm not going to follow you anymore. Amen. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. We ought to be ready to receive rebuke and correction and not stiffen your neck and harden your heart and say, no, I have anything to do with this. You're in Hebrews chapter 5, Look at verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 5, it's talking about Melchizedek earlier in the chapter. And verse number 11 says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. 
Now, the things that they had to say weren't necessarily hard, but the reason why they're hard to be uttered is because the, last, the latter part of the verse says, seeing ye are dull of hearing. You're, you, you don't want to hear anymore. You're sick of hearing about it, so that makes it even harder. Yep. A lot of the hard preaching wouldn't even really be that hard if you were ready to receive it. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be much of anything. A lot of things that I thought, oh man, that's really hard preaching. I go back and listen to it now. I'm just like, I don't see what's so hard about it. I really don't, honestly. I don't, I don't. You know, re ultimately the goal is no hard preaching should ever be hard for you, ever. Because if you have the right heart, if you have the right attitude, it won't be hard. The only reason why it's hard is because we get our minds set against doing what's right. And that's what makes it hard. And it's just like, oh man, I don't want to get rid of this sin. I don't, I don't want to change. That's what makes it hard. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And look at this, verse number 12. This is a rebuke going to the Hebrews. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you've been going to church long enough, you've been hearing the word of God long enough, you should be teaching other people. Say, for the time you've been in this long enough, but you're dull of hearing, and for the time you should be able to teach everybody. For the time you should be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's saying, you've been in here long enough, you're like this, think about a 40-year-old man. Say so you're 40 years, 40 years old. You ought to be able to teach people some things. You're 40 years old. You've been coming to church for 40 years. He says, but you're like a baby. These days, there's probably people ident identify as a, as a two-year-old in a 40-year-old body, right? I mean, but spiritually, that's what's going on, unfortunately. And this is what's being rebuked. Because when you don't want to listen to what's going on, when you don't want to listen to God's word, when you don't want to change, when, you, when you're not, when you're stiffening, your, you're hardening your heart and stiffening your neck, you're becoming dull of hearing. You're like this baby. You just need some milk. We just need to give you like the basics of the Bible because you're not growing. Your growth is stunted. You've been here for this long and you're still not growing. The problem is on you. Amen. You need to change your heart. You need to be ready to hear. You need to be able to endure the hard preaching and open up your ears a little bit and be receptive to God's word. It says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you come, to, you come to church for decades, if you don't do anything with it, you could hear it, you're still a baby. You're not going to be ready for the deep things of the Bible. You're not going to be ready for the strong meat. You're not going to be able to advance until you actually put into use the basic things that you learn. You know, if you're saved, but you just haven't been baptized in decades, you come to church, everything else. Get the basics under control. Get the bat. And it goes in in chapter six. He goes into some of the basics. You know, repentance of dead works, baptisms. Get baptized. You know, get these little things under control. Understand salvation so you can explain it to someone else. Turn if you would to Mark chapter four, please. Mark chapter four. How long are you going to be able to stand when the devil comes at you with his attacks if you can't even handle being rebuked from God's word? A good soldier endures hardness. In order to the, endure the external hardness, the spiritual fights that come your way, you need to endure the hardness inside first where you're going to receive that strengthening inside the church. Another attribute that we saw from 2 Timothy 2 about being a good soldier, because remember he said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We don't entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. If you're going to be a dedicated soldier, if you're going to be a good soldier, you can't be worried about everything else that's going on around you in this life. 
I mean, think about it. What, what, uh, soldiers, no, just modern day soldiers that go out into a battlefield and they fight. They need to be focused on what they're doing. They need to be in the moment, on the battlefield, and paying attention to everything that's going on around them. They need to be aware of sneak attacks. They need to be aware of their surroundings. Everything that's going around, they need to know where their, their um, fellow soldiers are and what they're doing so that the entire battle can push forward. So everyone's on the same page. We're all working in unity in our group, right? You're in your patrol, in your unit, your battalion, whatever, whatever it is out on the battlefield. If they're all just concerned about, oh man, I got this, you know, I wonder what, what's going on with my work or I want, you know, like my job, my, my job that I left to come fight this war. You start thinking about all these other things. It's just a big distraction and you're not going to be able to fight to the, the, the best way you're going to be able to. It's just going to be oh man, there's someone, there's someone right in front of me. I better pick up my gun now and, and hope I don't die because I've been thinking about and distracted with all these other concerns of everything else that's going on around me. We need to be able, I mean, think about Uriah the Hittite was a great example of a good soldier. Now, you remember the story, of course, King David is the one who, who sinned grievously and committed adultery with Uriah's wife. Uriah is out to the battle. And David just sitting at home, bored, spies Uriah's wife and he commits adultery with her. And then in order to try to cover up his sin, of course, he brings Uriah back. And he's trying to get Uriah to spend time with his wife because she's pregnant. And he doesn't want anyone to know that she's pregnant because obviously she's an adulteress. If she could, she, and it was, it was, he's responsible for it. So he's trying to make it look like, oh, okay, this could have happened. Because when Uriah's off the battle, there's no way he's going to get his wife pregnant. So he calls him back so that hopefully he could have some time with his wife. But you know what Uriah does? He comes back because he's, 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 he's a soldier, man. He's, he's on the job. He's doing his duty. He shows up. Yes, sir. You know, you called for me. I'm right here. What do you want me to do? And David tries to get him all drunk and, get, you know, and, and give him all this stuff and to send him home so that way he'll go home with his wife. He stays right outside of, of David's place. Why? He's got his mind focused on the bed. He says, I'm, I'm a soldier. I am operating as a soldier right now. All my other fellow soldiers, they're not going home with their wives tonight. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for orders just in case David the king wants me to do something else. I'm ready. I'm right here, ready to go at his doorstep. And he's so faithful, he's, he's, he even takes his own uh, letter, your know, message, doesn't read it, does his job, that, that actually is his death warrant. Uriah was a good soldier. Yeah. Uriah didn't entangle himself with the affairs of this world. Even when he had the, oppor he had the, he had the easiest opportunity to do it, but he says, nope, I've got a job to do and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to be distracted with anything. And that's not always an easy thing to do. I mean, especially in, in, in this sense of your wife. Who knows how long he's been off fighting, how long he's been away from his wife. I'm sure he loved his wife and would have loved to go and spend some time with her, but he determined, no, I am being a soldier right now and I need to fight. And we need to get an attitude sometimes that what are you doing? Like, are you even a soldier for Jesus Christ? Are you going up to the front lines on the battlefield and going out and knocking on doors and getting people saved? Because that is the number one thing that we need to be doing and we've been charged to do. As a, I mean, that's what the Apostle Paul was doing. We know he wasn't picking up weapons and going out and physically getting in fights with people. He was going out and preaching the word of God. Amen. Can you even call yourself a soldier today? Or are you just so wrapped up in the affairs of this world and everything else and just having fun, sitting by the pool, listening to music, doing whatever it is that entertains you, and never going out on the battlefield, not even once. Let alone being a good soldier who actually goes out on the battlefield and isn't just, you know, distracted with everything else. Are you even a soldier? Mark chapter 4, 
We're going to see again another reference to the parable of the sower. We can't get distracted with the world. It's going to choke you out so that you're no longer fruitful. Verse number 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and becometh unfruitful. And this is something you have to always be mindful of because maybe you were a fruitful Christian at one point. Maybe you did go out and win souls. Maybe you were reproducing and preaching the gospel. This can happen at any time. The cares of this world come in. Deceitfulness of riches. Oh, I'm so worried about the money and the, and the things and the fun and everything else in our life. The vacation, whatever. Everything else that, oh, all of a sudden you're not being fruitful at all. You become unfruitful. Because you've let the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world just choke it out. Turn if you to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The stuff around you, your day-to-day -day life, the things around you, this is all temporary. It's all going to be burned up. So why do you want to invest so much of your time in all of this other garbage of this world that doesn't really matter? It doesn't matter. Eternity is forever. Our life here in this battle is a very short life. Why do you care so much about the stupid things? Why? It's going to be gone, burned up. The Bible says this is our light affliction. What Paul called a light affliction would probably empty churches across America today. Yeah. He referred to as light. Almost everybody in churches today, they faced what Paul was facing, would be gone. Because sure. they're not ready for it. They haven't dedicated themselves to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. The affairs of this world are too much for them. He called it a light affliction. He says, you know what, this is light affliction, it's just for a moment. It's going to pass. Why? He had great foresight. He had great vision. He had great faith because he actually believes what the Bible says about the rewards and the judgment seat of Christ and all the things that are to come for eternity. He's saying, I could put up with this. <laughs> Bring it on. I, I'll put up with this. It's just a short time. I'll do it. For you, for Christ, for God, for the God that saved him who you owe everything to anyways. What are you really giving up? We think about it that way. Your soul has been saved from an eternity of burning in hell. Saved. Wiped clean. We owe that to God Amen. to give him our lives. People are so selfish and so caught up in this world. It doesn't mean anything. Happens all the time. We, you, need, you, know, you can't do anything about the people around you. You can do something about yourself. Amen. You need to worry about you not getting knocked out of this fight. Amen. Apostle Paul talks about actually some, some very good people that had done some good things and, and, and have been fellow laborers with him getting out of the fight. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, is that, did I have you turn there? Or no? Yes. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5, the Bible reads, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, 
but unto all them also that love is appearing. He knows this. I mean, he's stating it. This is a fact. He said, you know what? I fought a good fight. I did not get knocked out of this fight. I endured and I kept going. And he's not being proud here. He's not being arrogant. He's just stating a fact that the Bible says, look, if you can do this work, he said, I know that God's got a crown for me. I didn't get knocked out of this fight. I stayed in the battle. And that is what drove him throughout his life was seeing the eternal. And now in 2 Timothy, as he's nearing the end of his life, he sees, you know, that the, the time is coming for him. He's saying, this is, I've kept my eye on this prize. And look at his epistles. He talks about it frequently. Press for the, the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, right? I mean, that's, these are the things that he had continually in his mind to keep him strengthened, to, keep, to make him willing to endure the hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, knowing that this was coming. So he's saying, look, I'm ready for this. And not just me, everyone that loves is appearing. He says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Look at verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. He mentions all these people that were, you know, well, yeah, they left me. They're gone. They're not fighting with me anymore. They love, you know, Demas loved this, precious, this, this present world. He went to Thessalonica. I wonder if he went to the church at Thessalonica. Probably did. But he probably wasn't in the battle at all. He might have showed up every week or however often they were meeting. but wasn't willing to, to get in the fight and stand with Paul and endure. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. It's the last place I'll have you turn, Ephesians chapter 6. As a good soldier, we need to be ready and be protected for attacks. And of course, Ephesians chapter 6 is a passage that talks about the, the armor of God. Getting your defenses ready is a major priority for being a soldier. Even before you're too concerned about the offense, get yourself prepared, ready for the defense. You know, you don't need to take on every heretic on Facebook or whatever, Amen. okay? That's, you could, you could worry about that after you've gotten yourself prepared, spiritually ready. You got your armor on. You're ready for the battle. Who, who wants to run off into a fight without having a weapon, without having armor, without, you know, where you're much more vulnerable to being taken out? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. So you start off and say, hey, I'm going to get ready here. And the Bible tells us spiritually the armor that we need. It lays it out for us. If we're going to be a good soldier, well, how are we going to get ready, God. Well, here's how you get ready. Ver Ephesians 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not our fight. It's not physical armor. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a very important battle. I mean, you think about the wickedness that's going on in our world today and the evil, wicked people in charge of things. And, and I mean, you hear about the pedophile rings up. This is extreme wickedness and a lot of power. If you're going to fight against that, if you're going to fight against that corruption, that evil and that wickedness, you need to be ready. That's a serious fight. And it's a spiritual battle, no doubt. When you have the prophets calling out the wicked kings of their time, you better, you better believe they were ready and, and girded up to actually make that fight 
and confront that adversary. There is a lot of wickedness in this world. We cannot sit by idly and allow it to just continue and destroy and run rampant. That's why God has us here. We're supposed to be light and shining that light to combat the darkness. If you're not shining that light, the darkness is going to overtake everything. And this is extreme wickedness. We're talking. I mean, this is the, this, the rulers of the darkness of this world. This isn't average Joe drunk on the corner. This is seriously wicked people that are devising mischief and hate Jesus and want nothing to do but to destroy and to hurt and to tear down and be satanic. That's the adversary. We're saying, look, how are you going to stand against the wiles of the devil? Don't underestimate Satan. That's right. We know that God gets a victory over Satan every time and that God has strength no matter what. I mean, Satan can't do anything to God. But don't underestimate the strength of Satan. Right. Don't get so puffed up in your own mind, oh, Satan can't do anything. Don't have that attitude. You strengthen yourself, you put your armor on, you get ready for the battle. Don't be afraid of them, but don't underestimate them either. You don't fear. If God be with us, who can be against us? But don't just get this pompous attitude of just assuming that nothing's gonna, nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. Because it can and it will. We need to be ready. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He's it's such a, and look at verse 14. Stand therefore. Look at all of the importance of just being able to stand. God's saying, you just need to be able to endure. Just get yourself ready to stand. Because so many people get knocked out because the fight isn't that easy when you're fighting this spiritual battle, if you're really getting into the thick of it. He's like, I just want you to be able to stand through it. Endure. Just, just withstand. Having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. So here's, here's our armor. We need to have the truth, which we have right here in our hands today, readily available. This is what we gird ourselves with. This is what we're, we're holding everything together here with our belt, so to speak, is the truth. The truth from God's word. You need to know the truth to have that as part of your armor. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, your breastplate, that's the front part, is having a big, big shield here, right? Bulletproof vest. That's what we need spiritually. The big bulletproof vest that's able to stop um, all those attacks prevent the being injured is righteousness. Living righteously. Doing what's right. Being that good example. You know, not not have letting the adversary have anything evil to speak about you because of your own sins. That is a good defense when you're just doing what's right. It's going to be a lot harder for, for Satan to take you down when you're doing what's right. I mean, look at what they did with Daniel. His adversaries were constantly trying to find something against him because they're attacking him and trying to bring him down. He's doing too much for God. He's in the ear of the king. We need to take this guy out. But they couldn't find any way to do it concerning his walk, concerning his actions. He wasn't taking bribes. He wasn't doing anything shady. He wasn't involved in any sins. Any major sins, I mean, we know he's a sinner like everyone else, but he's not, he's not doing anything that's going to be like, they're going to have a weak point for them to attack him with. So if you're going to be a good soldier, you need to have the truth. You need to have righteousness. Getting the sins out of your life. And look, I mean, think about the politicians. How many people are being blackmailed and stuff because of, their, because of the wickedness that they've been involved with? So there's something to hold over their head? to get them even into more wickedness. We ought not, you know, 
There's nothing you can do about your past. But at the very least, you ought to be able to say, look, that was, you know, whatever that, whatever I did, that was a long time ago. And that wasn't right. But look at the way I'm living now. I mean, that's the way we always ought to be able to live is just say, look at what I'm doing now. You can't erase the past. And then be mindful that you can't erase the past. So you think about getting into any kind of sin at all, you're getting tempted with something that doesn't go away. Keep that breastplate on. Don't remove it to get involved in some wickedness. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet need to be, look, shod with the, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because you're bringing the gospel out there. You need to be prepared to bring the gospel out there on your feet. You need to be ready to do the work, right? That's why it's, it's on your feet, because you need to be going out and getting involved and going to the front lines and doing the work. You need to be prepared for that. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's ultimately what the Apostle Paul was relying on, was his faith, because he could see the things that were unseen. He knew the end of the matter. So when everything was going wrong temporarily in his life, everything the devil's trying to throw at him to get him out of the fight, his faith prevented all of those attacks from knocking him out, and he was able to stand. Keep that in mind, that faith of knowing God's not going to put me through anything I can't handle, one. And two, if I could endure this, if I could stand, there's a crown of righteousness that God's going to have for me at that day, that last day. When, when everything's finally said and done, God will recompense. God will actually reward for, for staying in this and, and thinking about that. Don't give up. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Obviously, your head needs to be protected with salvation and then um, the sword. This is the one aspect that that's, it should be able to use. A sword, not only as an offensive weapon, it's also defensive. You need to be able to use it both ways. You know, when that's what Jesus was doing when the devil was tempting Jesus in the desert. What did he answer with? Scripture. The devil's attacking him. What did he do? He defended himself with God's word. He was using that sword to, to deflect all the attacks of the devil. Verse number 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You know when you're praying always, that'll actually help your faith. The faith that was regarded as like the most important aspect of your, of your armor. Why? Because if you're praying, you're relying on God to help you with things. If you're relying on God, you're, you're keeping your faith in God and you're keeping your faith in His Word keeping that communication open will prevent you from maybe having a lapse of faith. Verse 19, And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The Apostle Paul knew about afflictions and he endured them, but what was the whole thing they're trying to get him to stop doing? preaching the gospel. He's saying, pray for me. I'm even in prison right now because of this. Pray that God will strengthen me. He talks about the whole armor and he's saying, I need strength. And what does he need strength for? To continue pushing forward in the battle and continue preaching the gospel. If you've been knocked out of the fight of preaching the gospel, you need to get back in the fight. You need to endure. You need to get yourself ready to get back out there. Look, if you're here today, you're not knocked out completely. Get back in it. Look at what the Apostle Paul withstood and think, can I do this? Or think, is, it just, is the world just crept in so much 
so much and infected my spirituality that I don't even care about the things of God anymore. That I don't care about the most important thing of going out and, and telling other people how to be saved. Is it that important? Look, we offer as much as I could possibly offer to you when it comes to soul winning. You look in the bulletin, we've got two different times, but it says, you know what it says? Contact us for additional soul winning times. That's been printed in this bulletin since the inception of this church. I could count on one hand the number of times I've had somebody contact me for additional soul winning times. The offer's there. Okay, I'm not going to make you do anything. The story is you, you need to decide if you're going to be a soldier. You need to decide if this is something that's important for you to do. I will do my best and try to bend over backwards to, to work with your schedule to get you out. And you know what? Maybe you're a lady and you want another lady to go soul winning with. Well, I know my wife has been unavailable for a while, but you know what? She's recovered now from having the baby. And I will work with her and her schedule so that I could stay home and watch the kids. If you want to go out, look, I'm willing to do this. I'll change my life and my schedule to fit you to be able to go out and preach the gospel. You have no excuses not to go out soul winning. I don't care who you are. This is what this church, if, if, you're, if you're coming here and you're not going soul winning, you don't even know what this church is about. And if you're going to be a soldier, you need to be able to endure this hardness. Maybe this is hard for you today. But the goal is to strengthen you. The goal is to get you ready for the battle. There is a battle out there. The Bible says we need to earnestly contend for the faith in the book of Jude. Earnestly. Fervently. Fight. Contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. A lot of people went through a lot of difficulty to get you the faith, to get you the word of God, to, to, to present this to you throughout generations when it's been illegal, when people are burned at the stake for preaching the truth. A lot of people, remember that, Memorial Day weekend, remember, remember what people have gone through for you to have true freedom in Christ. And you know what happens when you just toss it aside? You're making what they did in vain. You say, well, I'm saved, but I'm not going to tell anyone else about this. The fight's too hard. Gird up. Get your armor on. Let's, let's get the gospel out there. This is, this is what the primary focus is, what we're called to do. There's so many other things in this book. There's so many other things in our life. There's so many things going on. Let's not lose sight of the number one thing. Let's get people saved. Let's bow our heads. I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction from the Bible, dear Lord. I pray that you would please strengthen our church, dear Lord. Strengthen us all individually. Help us to to grow together spiritually, dear Lord. Help us to be there as fellow soldiers, one for another, God, to provide comfort and edification and, and to, to help lift people up and encourage, be an encouragement to go out and do this work. Help, God, help us not to be distracted with all these things going on around us, Lord, but to stay focused and not to be so consumed with the things of this world which are here today and gone tomorrow. God, we pray that you would please just... Um, Bless us and lead us to people that are going to be receptive to hearing your word, dear God. Help us to, um, to find those people out, to, search, to seek them out, and to preach them the word to the best of our ability, dear Lord, and help us to improve our ability so that, so that we can get as many people saved as possible and living for you, dear Lord. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.